Thanks a lot uh, for the invitation and to co-organize the conference. Uh, what I want to say, talk today is about a global safe asset for and from emerging market economies. Uh, it's joint work with um, a student of mine and, and Yuli Sanikov. So I want to start out with uh, three motivations, three stylized facts where I will build a model around it and then I will introduce a global safe asset which can be uh, generated uh, on its own. The first stylized fact is uh, there's a lot of trading activities going on in emerging economies by corporations and also by households. Then I want to highlight this flight to safety across borders and I will argue that's primarily the case because the safe asset is supplied a few countries and not symmetrically supplied. And then I will introduce some official reserve holdings in order to stem against this flight to safety capital flows. And I will want to show them in a model what distortions these reserve holdings are actually causing. And essentially, so far, the global financial architecture was very much focusing on building up reserves and buffers and going to the IMF or having some uh, swap line agreements. And I want to argue for a different framework where you have some rechanneling approach. Um, and I uh, will be more specific in a minute. <clears throat> so let me first start with the first stylized facts, just uh, mentioning that uh, in emerging market corporations borrow a lot in dollars. That's borrowed by uh, Bruno and Shin, uh, that this is actually dramatically going up uh, in a recent paper in the RFS. The same is true if you look at um, households, if you look at Hungary or, or Poland, there was a lot of um, uh, borrowing in euros and the Swiss franc going on by households, essentially doing a carry trade. That's from a recent paper by a student of, uh, in Princeton um, who is on the job market, uh, Emil Werner, just for illustration. The second uh, stylized connected to that is, of course, the sudden stops, where you have essentially carry trades. The returns on carry trades are very skewed. You, that's saying you go up the stairs, but you come down the lift. Uh, that's essentially where the skewness comes in. So whatever the currency, which is a high interest rate, if you do a carry trade, you get very, very skewed returns on that. The second stylized fact is this flight to safety. There's this risk on, risk off mode, and there's a huge uh, flight to safety into safe assets. And because the safe assets are asymmetrically supplied, primarily by the US and to some extent in Europe, by Germany and Japan, essentially what you have whenever you fly to safety, it leads to cross-border flows. Okay? And it's not necessarily necessary that you have actually, whenever there's flight to safety, it goes across borders. Um, but given that the safe asset is supplied by few countries which are seen as very sound and safe, that's the flight to safety is actually going across borders. And that's essentially an issue I would like to address, whether there's a different structure to avoid that actually that will lead to cross-border flight to safety flows. And what's interesting about that is that at times of global crisis, when the flight to safety occurs, actually it's very easy for the advanced economies to do some fiscal stimulus and stimulate their economy because that's when the time when the interest rate is actually going down for them to go further into debt is very easy. While for the emerging economies at times of crisis, the bond prices are depressed or the interest rate is very high, so it wasn't the conditions to do counter-cyclical fiscal policy or to do anything like this. So the question is essentially, who is insuring whom? And it seems like uh, the poor are insuring the rich uh, because they provide essentially, through this flight to safety, the poor are providing insurance uh, to the advanced economies. And one way to counterbalance that is to build up large buffers so the emerging economies can essentially build up large buffers in order to get rid of this insurance scheme which is automatically built in in the global financial architecture. So here, the way the counterbalance, which everybody knows, became very prominent after the Southeast Asia crisis, people are building up, or oh, no, countries, uh, emerging economies are building up huge amount of reserves. That's, uh, a map here showing the reserves, and you see uh, the countries which are very green, that's China has in huge amounts of reserves, but everybody else has reserves except, uh, on the other side, the red component is US, to some extent Germany and UK, uh, they're on the other side. And there's another chart which we took from IMF data, which we'll just see, we took out China because it would dominate the chart, uh, that's up to three trillion, these are all these countries, and I, I also pl plotted here Chile. Um, for building up these reserves. So this buffer approach essentially is uh, 
the traditional approach. And whenever there are some private imbalances building up, potentially because private households are doing a carry trade, so they go in the other direction, the, the public sector is building up buffers. And actually, that ensures the private sector. And you will have then more carry trades going on. So that's like a counter effect, some moral hazard in a sense, what's going on. You're subsidizing, essentially, carry trades if you build up reserves uh, from your country. And that's one way. So these reserves is one way to lean against Oops, to lean against these sudden stops and the sudden outflows. Another way is, of course, uh, the IMF, uh, various credit lines, liquidity lines you can draw on in order to lean against it, or the central, swap, central bank swap line arrangements. So all of this, the whole spirit is essentially whenever there's a, a flow in the opposite direction, you can draw on this and you can lean against that. And what I want to show in a model, what are the implications in a macroeconomy once you have to build up this, um, in a simple macroeconomy, you have to you build up these reserves, what are the implications of that? The alternative is, is to say, okay, the root of the, the root cause of the, or the problem essentially is essentially that the safe asset is not symmetrically supplied. Okay, can we address that? And that, I go back. Uh, to that's what the main message here is. That goes back to an idea I've had with Ricardo and others, so the Euronomics group, where we said, okay, that same problem you have at the global scale you also had in Europe between the core and the periphery. Whenever there's the Euro crisis became more severe, there was flight to safety into Germany in particular, and it was very cheap then for Germany to, to fund itself. Uh, relative to the peripheral countries. And we proposed at that time the SBs, which are now called the SBBS. You can still pronounce it SBs or pss, pss, if you want to. It stands for Sovereign Bond Backed Securities. And the idea essentially is uh, for the SBs uh, is essentially to pool of the sovereign bonds and issue a senior bond and a junior bond. And the junior bond essentially protects the senior bond because if there's any default on the on the senior bond on the on the sovereign bonds on the pool it will be first absorbed by the junior bond now if there's flight to safety the flight to safety then actually would go from the junior bond to the senior bond rather than uh, from one country to the other country so it would not be across border flows anymore from one country to the other country, but it would be actually from one European bond to another European bond, or here from another one emerging market bond to another emerging market bond. So the same idea you can just translate uh, uh, to, to the global scale. Of course, it's a little bit more challenging at the global scale because you have also a currency risk played around there, and that's also within the euro area, you don't have the currency risk to worry about. So instead of having cross-border capital flows, you would like to have uh, flows across asset classes, and they're all you know, offered by the same uh, entity. So it, you re-channel it from cross-border to across asset class capital flows. The purpose of this exercise in this paper, essentially, is to build a model and see how will this, such a vehicle, how can it affect the whole macroeconomy. So first to study, if you go the traditional way, the buffer approach, building up reserves, how will that affect the macroeconomy? And then once I put this in, how is the macroeconomy different? Okay, that's essentially uh, what I want to do. Uh, before I do this, I just want to uh, say what is a safe asset in, in the spirit of this exercise. Uh, and this goes back also to some work, uh, a discussion I had with uh, Valentina Dutt, and I build on that. So what we argue essentially, um, a safe asset has two characteristics. One is the good friend analogy. A safe asset is like a good friend. It is around when you need it. Like a friend, a good friend is around when you need him. And then there's the safe asset tautology, which says a safe asset is safe because it's safe, um, which means because it's perceived to be safe. This points to multiple equilibria, bubbles, and things like that. And in our setting, uh, the safe asset will be a bubble. Okay, so I will point, come to that. But let me just give you the good friend analogy again. So you often you say risk-free, a safe asset is risk-free, but the risk-free is always with respect to certain time horizon. It's risk-free overnight, risk-free for three months, risk-free for 10 years or 30 years. A safe asset is, is valuable when you really need it. Think of gold, it appreciates. Think of the US Treasury, it appreciates in times of crisis. And typically, the guys who have risky projects, they want to 
supplement the investment with a safe asset because they need something like this. So it's not the case in the real world that you have some guys who only hold safe asset because they're so risk averse. These are actually guys who have some risky projects. So well, and if their risk goes up, they want to shift the portfolio more into the safe asset. The safe asset tautology, you might say, oh, safe because it's safe, that's not a theory, but let me just uh, highlight two examples, I think, which are very striking. One is uh, the, in the summer of 2011, uh, the US Treasury was about to default on, uh, on its bonds, uh, and it was downgraded by S&P, but nevertheless, the yield went down, okay? Because a crisis really caused by the US, but the bond prices, US Treasury bond prices went up, uh, and that's, you know, because People said, oh, this will trigger a crisis, and everybody was running in US Treasuries, but the same US Treasuries were subject to default because the Congress couldn't agree on uh, you know, getting a new budget in order. Similarly, what I've plotted here, I've plotted here the CDS spread and the 10-year yield of the German Bund, so the German sovereign debt. And what you see in the summer of 2011, it was the case that the euro crisis became more severe. A lot of French banks also were in, in quite severe stress at that time. And the CDS spread for the German Bund went up, indicating that actually the, the German default rate is higher. Of course, there's a lot of other stuff in the CDS spread. But at the same time, actually, the German yield came down. So that's essentially what I mean. Even if the fundamentals worsen, it could be that uh, the, the yield is actually going down or the price is going up. So it indicates this multiple equilibrium story or this bubble component. In our setting, it will be uh, a bubble component. So what I want to do is, so uh, motivated with this, and you probably see where I'm going, but I want to put this whole thing in, in a macro model. And given that Ricardo broke the raw ice and started with continuous time modeling, so I will do the same thing. And, uh, and if you're unhappy about it, you should talk to Ricardo about it. <laughs> um, so I will start with a model, first an autarky model, which is very much a benchmark model, uh, taking for the I theory of money uh, I have with Yuli, and then we add some foreign reserve holdings to it, we add some FX carry trades to it, okay? And then see how the whole model plays out. And I will focus here on steady state analysis just to keep the model as closed form as possible. This you will see. It's uh, almost closed form, everything. So let me start with the baseline model. Uh, it's like an autarchy model. Think of one emerging economy. There's no international component yet uh, to it. So there's some physical capital. Uh, you can invest in physical capital, create new physical capital at the investment rate of IOTA. Um, and that creates additional capital. And the capital itself is also shocked by the idiosyncratic shock. There are many households, many firms in this uh, continuum of firms in each country, or in this particular country, and these are all idiosyncratic shocks. So in aggregate, they wash out, to keep it simple. And each firm is just producing, depending on its capital, there's some TFP to it that has a certain output rate, uh, Y, and IOTA times K, that's essentially Part of the output is, of course, used to produce new machines or new physical capital. Um, there is demand for a safe asset. And the balance sheets of the firms or the households in the emerging economy look like this. They have a certain amount of productive capital and a certain amount of domestic safe asset. In the I theory, that's money. But you can, you to call it, you can think of uh, government debt, long-term, uh, whatever, short-term or long-term government debt. Uh, and then that's the net worth. There's no sh debt in this. Uh, the households have no debt. So the households essentially are deciding how much of their wealth, the net worth, to put into machines to produce something or hold it in this domestic safe asset. And the value of a machine is Q, or the price of the machine is a Q, and in total economy, the total capital stock in the economy is capital K. Oops, sorry. Uh, and that's the value of all physical capital. And the return on holding a machine or physical capital is just A times K, that's what the output you get, minus Aota times K, that's the output you have to use to reinvest, so that's not really what you can consume. Divided by the price of the machines, that's the dividend yield, the first term here. And, and then, of course, if you have a high Aota, you create new machines, that's also part of your return, because you create new machines. And then you have this shock, this, uh, that's a shock from here up. And that's the idiosyncratic shock you're facing. Uh, 
if uh, if the, let's say the stock of uh, safe assets stays fixed, then the value of all the safe asset is p times k. Let's ignore inflation for the time being. And essentially, the value of the safe asset grows with the growth rate of the economy. The growth rate of the economy by this AK model is just the growth rate of K. Okay? I could have this phi function is an adjustment cost function. It's concave. It, it also incorporates already this minus delta, which is a depreciation rate. So that's already put in to keep it simple. Okay, in this economy, everybody has log utility, everybody has a time preference rate of rho, and everybody has, all of the households or firms have to decide about the investment rate, iota, how, on their portfolio choice, how much to put in physical capital, how much to put into this safe asset, and the consumption choice. That's the three decisions they have to make. Uh, the investment rate is a purely static decision. Uh, it's just traditional Tobin's Q, and here that's essentially the derivative of phi is 1 over q, and we just assume a particular phi function, that's the log adjustment cost function uh, we have used earlier, which gives us a, a very nice uh, solution for the investment rate. What's new here is this iota zero, which is like a target investment rate uh, you would like to have. Uh, the portfolio choice is because everybody has log utility. It's uh, very simple too, because of log utility in this continuous time framework, what you get essentially is that the expected excess return between the capital return and the safe asset return, that's D here for domestic safe asset. Uh, so this excess return, the expected excess return has to be equal to the excess return, uh, equal to the covariance between the excess return with the net worth you have. So your universal net worth. Okay, universal net worth, how does universal net worth move around? It's essentially, um, if you have a, a portfolio share of X, um, and let's suppose you put 100% into capital, then it would actually mean, uh, sorry, there's a typo here, it should be min minus X here. But essentially, uh, if you have a portfolio share of, let's say, of 100% uh, in capital, and let's put, suppose that's one minus x here, but then you have actually just DRK. If your portfolio share only of 100% um, of into the sa domestic safe asset, you have this, uh, the return uh, of this domestic asset, otherwise you have some convex combination of that. And you can see that this is actually orthogonal to this, so all what matters at the end is essentially the volatility of the return of capital. Okay, so that's is coming from the earlier part. This was from the previous slide. Oops, let me just move to this was the return of capital. So the the riskiness comes all from this component. So now you essentially can bring the x outside of the covariance, and if this twice is term term, it's just the variance, so you get x times the idiosyncratic risk sigma tilde. And then if I rearrange that, I get just the portfolio share, the share you want to put into um, the capital is just the expected excess return divided by the idiosyncratic risk. So what does it mean in economics? If you have a certain amount of wealth and you think, where should I put this wealth? Should I put it into the safe asset? Or should I put it into the machine? If I put it in the machine, it has the advantage, it gives me some, essentially some dividend yield. That was this A minus iota over Q. So I get some dividends from, the machine is producing something. The safe asset is not producing anything. Okay, it gives me this uh, additional dividend yield. But it has a disadvantage that I'm exposed to idiosyncratic risk. So if I put it in the safe asset, I'm not exposed to the idiosyncratic risk. Remember, each of these individual firms, they have idiosyncratic risk they have to bear. And if I put it in the safe asset, I don't have the idiosyncratic risk. If I put my money into the, a physical machine, then I actually have to bear the idiosyncratic So high the, the higher the idiosyncratic risk, the less I put it in capital, the higher the dividend yield, the, high, the more I put in the capital. So the higher is the uh, portfolio share. <coughs> 
So the third choice is then essential task consumption. And we know with log utility, uh, the time reference rate was rho. You just want to consume rho times your net worth. What is the net worth in this economy? Total net worth is capital N. So and that consists of Q times K, which is the value of the machines, and P times K, which is the value of the safe asset. Okay? So that's the total demand for safe asset. So we had these three optimality conditions. Now we have to impose market clearing. So for the capital markets clearing, you have to make sure that the portfolio share everybody puts into capital is equal to supply of capital in a value terms. So Q times K over Q times K plus P times K, that's essentially total supply. That's capital markets clearing. And then I also have goods market clearing. So total demand for output goods was given by that. Total supply for consumption is essentially A minus iota times the aggregate capital stock. And that's essentially my uh, output market clearing conditions. I can put this together, and that's essentially a one equation uh, I get right away out of that. So if you put all of this together, you can solve the whole thing in closed form very nicely. You can teach it to undergrads. Uh, that's what I do at Princeton. Um, and um, you get extremely, uh, you get very nice closed form solutions for the price of a machine and also for the value of the safe asset. And what's interesting is if the idiosyncratic risk goes up, the value of the safe asset goes up, and the, value, the price of the machines goes down. Okay, and that makes perfect sense. And what's interesting, especially, is that the safe asset itself never pays any dividend. No? It's, it's, it's a total bubble. So it just grows and it's just there. Uh, but it grows at the rate of the economy, and it's fine. It's also, I should just highlight, it's different from an OLG setting where you need this R versus G. We don't need this here. No, that's the dynamic inefficiency is very different in this framework than from a traditional OLG setting. Okay, so that's that's a baseline model. So in this baseline model, we live in Chile. Every, there are a lot of households and firms and every, all of them decide between how much to put in safe asset and how much to put in physical capital, and this depends how much idiosyncratic risk they're exposed to and how productive what the TFP is of these firms. And this determines then if the idiosyncratic risk is very high, then people put more in the safe asset. If it's very low, then they put more into capital. I should say, of course, the, in, the price of capital determines the investment rate, hence it determines the growth rate of the physical capital stock, and it determines the total growth rate of the economy. Okay. So if the price of physical capital is lower, the growth rate of the economy will be lower. Okay. So if you reduce idiosyncratic risk, Q is going up, and with it, with it this iota is going up, and with it the growth rate of the economy is going up. Okay, but that was essentially uh, part of the I theory, uh, the benchmark model. Now I wanted to put some reserves in some FX trading. So that's a new picture I would like to have. And then later we'll have many emerging countries, but now I've only one. Okay, so we have the same as before, but uh, they hold this domestic safe asset. But now there's emerging countries that can also borrow in dollars, okay? And the dollars come from the US. And on the safe asset, that's essentially from the central bank or the banking system in the emerging economy. It's partly based on this bubble asset I was talking before, but also partly backed by US treasuries, okay? These are the reserves, okay? So that's essentially the economy I would like to study and analyze. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, so now let me go through each of these, uh, especially the household and the firms and the central bank uh, problems to solve. I, I should highlight there's, a, of course, a carry trade. So these, the firms will borrow in dollars at the lower interest rate, and then they hold this domestic safe asset, which gives a higher interest rate, which depends on the growth rate of the emerging economy. Okay, that's, just, that's where the carry trade goes on. Because of the carry trade, uh, there might be a sudden stop, and we will, they're worried about this, and that's why the central bank is holding some US treasuries. Okay, okay. so now let's just go, let's first study the, the firms and households of, of the emerging economy. Now, the whole problem is a little more complicated now because I have the portfolio share in capital, I have the portfolio share in this domestic safe asset, and then they, go, they issue corporate bonds no? in dollars. Okay, and that's, that's why it's negative, so the portfolio share becomes negative, so that's color coded here. Uh, that's the physical capital share, that's domestic safe asset, and then there's dollars that are going short. So why do they do the carry trade? As I mentioned before, um, the domestic safe asset typically earns more 
if there are no uh, if there are no reserves, essentially it earns the growth rate of the economy, and that's larger, we assume, than the borrowing rate in US dollar. Okay. We also assume that there is a, a borrowing limit or some capital control, so you can only do it up to a certain level. Okay, so uh, how many dollars you can borrow, that's how many you go long, so it uh, is actually uh, is limited by, by, by a leverage constraint. That's your physical capital wealth, and you can use that up to a certain leverage ratio of this phi, okay? So, and in this setting, uh, you go all the way, okay? That's a risk-free, as long as I haven't introduced the sudden stops, I will do this later, that's a risk-free arbitrage, uh, you go all the way to the borrowing limit, okay? So that's the first new element. We are still have to do this optimal capital holdings, so that's like the, the first element here, and that's the same what we had before. The only difference now is that we have some collateral booster. So we, we argue here that you need um, essentially physical capital as a collateral. So given that, it's actually good to have more machines because the machines actually serve as a collateral. And given that you have as a collateral, um, it gives you some real direct return from holding machines, but it also relaxes your collateral constraint. Okay? So that's some additional benefit from holding machines. And that affects uh, the optimality conditions. That's your net worth evolution. Uh, you get, that's a portfolio share, you get the capital return. That's a portfolio share, you get the domestic safe asset. That's the portfolio share, you, that's negative. You borrow at dollars, and then you consume at this rate. If you put everything together, we have the same as before, except that we have these additional terms here. And you can see already there's some collateral booster is showing up here, and this difference from the carry trade is showing up here. So that's a new problem, a new portfolio share for the households. What does the central bank do in this model? So we assume the central bank is essentially issuing, or the banking sector in general is domestic safe assets. Uh, and part of it, alpha share is backed by US dollars, and one minus alpha is this bubble thing uh, we had before. The bubble grows at the growth rate of the economy, and uh, the US treasury is essentially only grow at our low about dollar. So if you park money with US Treasury, you get the low interest rate, and that's we assume as exogenous. We don't model the US. So the US is just a storage technology in a sense. And, and the change in the FX is essentially the interest rate you get on the FX holdings and the new US reserves you buy. Okay? And, uh, and of course, by doing this, you might make profit or not. You have some transfers. What we assume is that uh, the transfers you can pay them out proportionate to the net worth of the individuals and households, that's fine too. We just assume they don't pay out anything, they're just the rate they're paying on the domestic safe asset in such a way that there are zero profits. Okay, that's our assumption. Okay, so there's no fiscal implication at all and no redistribution at all. It's just we adjust the domestic safe assets interest rate in such a way that, you know, this <coughs> entity, oops, I moved too fast, uh, this entity has, gets, with alpha share, gets the interest rate of R lower bar, that's the US dollar rate, and one minus alpha, there's the bubble growth at the rate of the economy in the emerging economy. Okay, then we do the same uh, market clearing again, and let me jump over that um, and go to the results. So what are the equilibrium effects? So there are several equilibrium reflect. Uh, effects from reserve holdings. So if I just focus on reserve holdings, which shows up in this alpha, as I mentioned before, it will affect immediately this RD and so forth. There's the first equilibrium effect is from the, from the fact that, you know, let's suppose the emerging economy is growing at 4% and the US Treasury is only paying 1% interest rate. As the emerging economy grows 4%, the reserve holdings are not keeping up with the growth of the economy, so we have to buy more and more new reserves. Okay, so the, the reserves upkeeping effect, essentially, you have to export constantly goods in order to buy more U.S. treasuries in order to keep my reserve. If I'm on a balanced growth path, to keep my FX reserves relative to the economy size constant. Okay, so that's the first the reserve upkeeping effect. That actually pushes Q down. That was the price of physical machines which translates in lower IOTA, which translates in lower growth rate. Then there's a portfolio rebalancing effect, uh, which comes from the fact that uh, holding of domestic safe assets is less attractive, 
So if there are more reserves, the reserves essentially give a lower yield. They're only paying, US pays only 1% or whatever. That means that a domestic safe asset, if there's a large fraction is backed by reserves and not by this bubble which grows at 4%, but with reserves which pay 1%, that means the domestic safe asset becomes less attractive and physical capital becomes more attractive in my portfolio choice between the two. That actually pushes Q up. And then there's some effects from the carry trades. So that's, I'm not sure whether I can see it, that's from this. I make, of course, benefits from the carry trades. That actually um, makes uh, the first effect I mentioned already collateral boost because physical capital is, is, is a good collateral. So it gives me an additional boost in the collateral so it relaxes my credit constraint. And more generally, if there's larger reserves, it pushes RD down and this creates um, uh, these two effects I mentioned above. Now, so that's, that's uh, the economy I played with without sudden stops. There are just, there's some FX trading going on so far, and there were some reserves. And the reserves were just held intuitively. I didn't have some sudden stops uh, in the model. Now, let's put in some sudden stops on top of it. So essentially, the way we do it is uh, as a sunspot, and the sunspot might potentially trigger the US investors not to roll over the, the dollar denominated uh, corporate bonds the emerging economy is issuing. What the first result uh, is uh, obvious that if uh, the reserves are sufficiently high that you can pay off all this dollar denominated debt, which is in the private sector, then there will never be a run because it's just to just enough uh, reserves in the system. So that's one thing. If you don't have enough a sudden, a re, a reserves and sudden stops can occur. And then we have to describe the system, what happens when, when there is a run and how will the system jump to what new steady state will it jump or how the transition, we have to work hard to make sure that we jump to a new steady state right away and don't have a transition part. And what will happen is actually the exchange rate jumps and then you jump to the new steady state. Um, so let me just reiterate, so you have this new steady state, new steady state, you use up all the reserves, hence you get the same formulas as before, just the alphas go all to zero and a lot of terms uh, drop out. Um, so what we also do, we also do anticipated sudden stop. So far what I did is an unanticipated sudden stop. What happens? You can also anticipate it with this arrival rate. Of course, the portfolio choice, everything is more complicated because now I have jump risk. Now there's some jump risk component to it. And then we can only solve it numerically. But what's interesting, so let me just highlight, as the reserves alpha go up, the Q is going down. That's with anticipated and without, that's unanticipated sudden stops and that's with anticipated sudden stops. It works the same way. As the reserves holdings go up, the Q, the price of capital, is going down, and with it also the growth rate of the whole economy. Also, the value of the domestic safe asset is going down as well. Okay? So both actually is, is suffering from the fact that uh, the emerging economy is uh, holding so much of reserve assets. And you can also characterize how big the jump in, in the and the Q will be, that's uh, given by here, and also the, the jump in the exchange rate. Problem is, I might not keep up with the promise. Oh. Um, and there was so much pressure initially on the time limit. Um, so that, that's essentially, we, we solve it for both. We have this unanticipated uh, jumps, then you can solve before the jump and after the jump in closed form, you can characterize it perfectly. Um, if you have anticipated jumps, it gets more complicated and then we only can solve it only numerically. Now, the, the main message in the, for the last one minute and 20 seconds is essentially let's introduce some global safe asset. So there will be now many emerging, con there's a whole continuum of emerging economies. And then there is, if there's a sunspot to one emerging economy, uh, that's not so interesting, not, not, nothing much is coming. But let's suppose there's a sunspot, which is a systemic sunspot, and it potentially triggers a sudden stop in a fraction delta of the emerging economies. Now that's, uh, uh, so the potential trigger is there. And of course, if there are enough reserves, then you, there will be none. An alternative essentially is this a global safe asset for and from the emerging economies. You pool the sovereign bonds, have a senior bond and a junior bond, and uh, uh, this junior bond absorbs this potential 
uh, exchange rate risk uh, going on as well. Okay, so it's just some default risk, but here it's essentially primarily uh, exchange rate risk going on. You can solve that. Uh, again, here's the system of equations you have to solve. It's fairly simple to solve. What's interesting is that if the junior bond is sufficiently thick, actually it should be thicker than to, to potentially cover the delta fraction of, um, of the countries which are affected by this. So the idea we have, there's a lambda arrival rate with a sudden stop, and then among the continuum of the countries, a fraction delta, which IID drawn on a fraction delta, essentially get uh, then the sunspot shock. If the junior bond is sufficiently thick, then actually the sunspot will never do anything. So what happens then is the junior bond itself is also risk-free. So it just happens uh, this way. And so the senior bond and the junior bond are both risk-free, then the whole model is very simple to solve because the interest rates on both are the same as well. So the whole riskiness of all the structure is actually endogenously affected by that. And of course, endogenously also affect how the economy grows. And it can easily be seen that uh, the Q is higher, and with it, the growth rate of the economies, of the emerging economies, is higher. And um, um, yes. So let me uh, conclude. Uh, so I tried to capture here a global safe asset from and for the emerging economies. And, and in order to capture that, uh, some carry trade activities going on among emerging economies, corporations and households. And this is risky, it leads to some potential collapses when a sudden stop occurs and because the root cause of the problem is essentially the safe asset, where the safe asset, everybody's flying in the safe asset, is so asymmetrically distributed across the globe. The question is how can we distribute the supply of the safe asset more homogeneously across the globe? And the traditional approach essentially is to have official reserve holdings or approach the IMF. Uh, here it's a different approach, it's like a rechanneling approach instead of this buffer approach. This reserve holdings itself, we argue, distorts the whole world economy. It leads to lower growth in the emerging economies. We did not incorporate yet that, you know, it also leads. Of course, the emerging economies constantly have to export. They have to have an export surplus in order to buy additional US treasuries to stay on top of this. So that's natural, comes out of this model. What we didn't do in this model, if you have in this emerging economy some citizens who can do some uh, carry trades and others who can't, there of course there's a redistribution within the emerging economy to citizens who have the ability to do the carry trade because essentially you subsidize the carry trade, you provide us a government a guarantee uh, for potential sudden stops going on. So that's essentially this approach is I think different from the traditional approach and I think it's, it's more focused on the underlying cause of the problem. Thank you very much, Marcus.